20, and uh, we're starting verse 31, Acts 20, verse 31. We'll go ahead and read down to the end of the chapter, and uh, maybe we'll get all that way, maybe, maybe a little further, I don't know. But Acts uh, 20, starting in verse 31. This is still uh, Paul meeting with the elders at the, of the church at Ephesus. And uh, he is uh, uh, about to wind up the, the meeting here, I think, because in chapter 21, he goes on to another place. But verse 31 says, there, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing uh, most uh, of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. So if you look back with me to verse number 31, as, he, as we kind of, I guess, Diving right back into the middle of or toward the tail end of the his meeting with the elders, he's telling them how important God's word is. We've talked about wherever Paul has gone, that he has uh, given out the gospel, and uh, he's saying as he leaves that that's what they need to be upholding is the uh, preaching of the word, teaching of the word. And uh, I'm just going to read uh, a few things that what few people say about these verses. And uh, they start out by saying that the church needs to be fed. And they're not talking about a casserole. They're talking about uh, with God's word. Uh, so they say the church must be fed because God has purchased the church and paid the supreme price for it with his own blood. Uh, Jesus is uh, God. He's the one who shed his blood to purchase the church. Uh, he, since he purchased the church, the church is his. We uh, sometimes uh, say, uh, I've heard songs written that uh, such and such pew's mine, the kitchen's mine, this and that's mine, but the church is his. He owns it. And he, since he owns it, he should have the say-so uh, concerning everything that goes on. Uh, it shouldn't be my way. shouldn't be your way. It should be his way. Uh, the church must be fed because it is the duty of us as church leaders to make sure the church gets what it needs to grow closer to the Lord. Uh I've told you that uh, I showed up. Uh, there were several things that I wasn't told up front when I went to pastor the church in Florence. And I won't go get into all of it, but uh, one day, one Sunday morning, I showed up and uh, getting ready for Sunday school. And they said, oh, our Sunday school teacher's not here. You're the sub. You know, a little bit of uh, further notice. Longer time notice, that, that would have been nice. But anyway, they gave me this book and said, uh, we'd like to hear stories out of it. And there uh, was some wonderful stories out of that, I guess. But uh, that was the only time I ever used it because I prefer using the Word of God uh, instead of what somebody else has written. But it should be our job as leaders of the church to make sure the church is fed. Uh, 
One reason the church needs to be fed is we need to be able, as the body of Christ, to distinguish between true teachers and false teachers. False teachers are going to come into the, into the church, the local church, try to uproot it, try to do this, try to do that. Uh, brings to my memory uh, when I was going through the Liberty Home Bible Institute, the dean of that school, Dr. Harold Wilmington, wrote a book. And the book was titled, if I can remember correctly, What uh, If I Were Satan. And so he listed several things, my understanding, in that book, what he would do if he was Satan. Number one, he'd be in the pulpit. Number two, he'd be in the church pew, trying to stir up trouble. And that's why we as body of Christ, needs to be fed. And the final reason they give that the church should be fed is that Paul gives the ultimate uh, example of that here. He tells them there in verse 31, he said, I've, these three years I've ceased not to warn every one of you night and day with tears. And verse 32, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. It wasn't uh, some book you buy down at the bookstore. It wasn't uh, some the most popular thing on the national bestseller list. He was commended them to the Word of God, which I think, by the way, possibly still could be the highest selling book of all times, but it may not be on the New York Times bestselling list today. So I commend you to God, commend you to the Word of His grace. Why? It's able to build you up. And so often uh, we might get, well, we've heard that time and time again. We've heard that scripture. We've read that scripture. Why do we need to hear it again? Because it's still God's word. And what we might have got out of, yet, out, of, out of it yesterday, the Lord may be, able to, may be wanting to show us something different today that we need today, but didn't need yesterday. Next week, he may show us something else out of the same scripture we've been reading and that we wasn't ready for this week. Uh, in my daily Bible reading, I was uh, listening to this the other day, and it brought back so many memories. Uh, Y'all have heard my story about I used to be one of them that... Uh, that wasn't necessarily to read the Bible through, but uh, Lord, what do you want me to read tonight? And I reckon I had my Bible trained. Did I, or Lord was talking to me. Anyway, Romans 13, 11 through 14, it kept, I read that day after day, night after night. And when uh, I heard that the other day, it brought back so many memories. That knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night's far spent, the day's at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So day after day, night after night, that's what scripture I was reading, Lord dealing with me, speaking with me, and uh, he's telling them here, I'm, gonna, I'm commending you to God, I'm commending you to the word of his grace to build you up. And I hope there's none amongst us that says, oh, I've got enough. Lord, I don't need anything else. You don't need to teach me anything else. Because uh, go back to one of the stories that Brother Butler shared with us. There was a, a fella that thought he never did have time to... Uh, do anything for the Lord. 
He didn't have time to do this. He didn't have time to do that. He was all about doing what he wanted to do. And brother, but it was back in the days where Brother Butler passed away in uh, 1992. So most everybody had a house phone. And Brother Butler said, uh, Lord just laid him flat his back in the hospital. And he had all the time in the world to get the phone book out and look up people's numbers and call them and tell them about Jesus then. So he says, I'm commending you to God. I'm commending you to the word that you might be built up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified, that have been set aside to do his work. So false teachers, where are they going to come from? Well, sometimes they come from outside the church. Sometimes they come from inside the church. But they're there. And oh, they can make things sound so good. With just enough scripture to make you think, well, they ain't that great. But be careful. False teachers draw away disciples. They attack believers. They teach error. They attack the genuine leaders, blemishing the characters, ministries, stirring up believers against them. Uh, one thing uh, I think I brought up the other day, but we didn't turn over there, and that, that just reminds me of this list. If you'll look with me to Proverbs chapter 6, I mentioned Sunday about there being some things listed in Proverbs that uh, God hates, and if uh, God hates hates them, then uh, we pretty much ought to be against them as well. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6, starting in verse number 16. He gives us this list. He starts out by saying there's six and then changes that number to seven before he's finished up with the, that verse. It says, these six things that the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. And uh, without, you know, I know some of you didn't glance down through there, probably didn't read the next couple of verses, but what kind of list would we make? Well, here's the list. A proud look. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. Our feet should be swift in running about telling the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It should be an exact path that we walk upon that he's laid out for us. Verse 19 a false witness that speaketh lies. And then here's this last one. He that soweth discord among the brethren. And that was one of the list, in the list that they had that they would uh, attack the church, attack the leaders, attack uh, teach error, and just believers themselves would be attacked by these false teachers. But Paul says... I want to commend you to God. I want to commend you to the word of God, which is able to build you up, to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Uh, if you'll look down to verse 33 of Acts 20, Acts 33 and 34, he tells them that uh, he, he reminds them that he didn't take... Uh, money necessarily from them that but he, he worked with his hands while he was there at Ephesus. And if you remember he's a he's a tent maker. So verse thirty three says, I coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. And I believe that's one of the as an overseer, as a pastor, uh that is uh one of the qualifications, not doing it for filthy lucre's sake. Not uh, doing it uh not that the money is all that bad, but it's the love of money that turns, uh, that's 
the Bible says is what's wrong. It leads us astray. Uh, verse 34, Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered into my necessities and to them that were with me. And uh, so he uh, not only took care of his necessities through his work, but he also took care of those that were with him uh, through his work. Now let's look at the uh, rest of this chapter, 35 through 38. He said, I have showed you things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And uh, if you've been in a situation where you could give something and it not be made a big deal out of, that you just did it out of love for somebody, and uh, it might not have been money, yeah. But what a blessing that, if you've been in that situation, what a blessing that is. Now, I've been in situations where people come in and uh, they're able, Lord's blessed them, they're able to give a, a big amount. And then uh, I've heard it blasted from the pulpit. Well, it's good to have brother and sister so-and-so today. They wrote a $500 check today. Yeah, I hope... Uh, I hope I'm never in a position where, number one, that I know what somebody's given, and number two, that I am never have the urge to tell that in front of everybody. Another instance, uh, I remember, uh, it's good to have Brother So-and-So here. He's, uh, he's given quite a bit amount of money to get our parking lot paved. And uh, knowing those individuals, I don't think they wanted the, the horn blasted in front of them. But... Just remember this, as Paul said in verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Romans 15 verse 1 says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not just to please ourselves. So it's more blessed to give than to receive. So, Look at the closing here as he closes this, as this meeting winds down with the elders of the church at Ephesus. And when they had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all, and they all wept sore, fell on Paul's neck, and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more, and they accompanied him into the ship. Now, we've been going through the, as we're going through the book of Matthew on Sunday evenings, uh, we're at the point where Jesus has made it to Jerusalem. And chapter 21 of Acts, Paul is going to make it to Jerusalem. A lot of folks say that, uh, again, that he uh, shouldn't have went there. But I'm going to, Caution you about saying that again about Paul because there was one area that he wanted to go in. I mean, really wanted to go. And Holy Spirit said, no, you ain't going. But as he's going to Jerusalem here, you won't see that, that Holy Spirit ain't telling him not to go. There's some folks that telling him not to go. There's some commentators that say he ought not have went, but the Holy Spirit of God didn't tell him no as he had before. Uh, let's look at uh, verses 1 through 3 of uh, chapter 21. So uh, they accompanied him into the ship, ending up chapter 20, and it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course into uh, Coos, and the day following into Rhodes, and from thence to uh, Patera. Finding the ship sailing over into Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth, and when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand uh, and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, 
for there the ship was to unlaid her burden. Notice that uh, chapter 20 says they, and then chapter 21 starts with the we again, because that shows us that Luke is there uh, with him again. So he's uh, he took take, took a ship at Miletus, uh, J. Vernon McGee says, and sailing sailing toward Tyre, and that's going to be on the the sea coast north of Caesarea. Uh, totally on the co it was actually on the coast of Israel in what was ancient Phoenicia. Today uh, we'd call that Lebanon, or in J. Vernon McGee, I don't know if it's still got the same name or not, but. I think most of us have heard Lebanon in their life. So this is where he's at. And uh, if you look there in verse 3, it says they discovered Cyprus. Cyprus was done there. Uh, I don't think it means to uh, say that uh, they was the ones that located it first. I believe it was done people there. Uh, so they saw uh, this ship there. Discovered Cyprus on the left hand, sailed into Syria, landed at Tyre, for there was the ship to unlaid her uh, burden. So, has anybody got any uh, comments or anything on that? Looking down on, uh, on down to uh, verses 4 through 9, finding themselves... Uh, and finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go to Jerusalem. Uh, who said he shouldn't go? The disciples said that uh, he shouldn't go. When we had accomplished uh, those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought uh, us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city. We kneeled down on the shore and prayed. Isn't that something? We can go on a trip. And what did they do first? They got together and prayed. And when we had taken uh, uh, our leave one of another, we took ship and returned home again. And we, when uh, we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to uh, Ptolemus and saluted the brethren and bowed with them one day. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed, came into Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, which is one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Now, who's Philip? Philip, it says there he was one of the seven. If you remember, he was one of the seven men set aside as uh, what we call deacons. Uh, and over in Acts chapter 6, he's the one that met the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. And uh, what did he do? Did he run up and get on the chariot and say, let me go get the pastor and I'll be back? No. He started right where the Ethiopian eunuch was reading. Ethiopian eunuch said, I can't understand it unless somebody tells me what it means. And he took at the very part that he was reading and uh, Preach to him Jesus. And uh, some of you Bibles in Acts uh, chapter 8 might not have Acts 8, 37, unless it's in the footnotes. Uh, I always like to have kids, uh, when I was teaching uh, Bible classes, youth class or whatever, if I knew what kind of translation of the Bible they had, to have them they read Acts 8, 37, because some Bibles don't have it. Uh, and that tells you how powerful the numbering system is is that they would have 36, 38 but they'd skip 37, maybe have it in the footnotes. But this is what it says verse 37 and it says in the most uh, translations that the uh, matter of fact Schofield Bible here, King James Version Schofield says the best authorities omit verse 37 they came to a place where there's water and the Ethiopian eunuch said, uh, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And this is verse 37. 
Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so then verse 38, he commanded the chariot to be stopped. And they would both went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. But one thing to keep in mind, as we, we read it, I think, a few weeks ago, 2 Timothy 4 Paul writes to Timothy and says this, I have finished my course. I finished my course. Whose course was it? I believe it was the course that uh, the Lord had set out for him. And uh, he declares unto Timothy that he has finished that course. Uh, has anybody got anything tonight before we dismiss? Thank y'all for, for being here. And we'll take up, uh, Lord willing, next time in uh, verse number four. Or excuse me, uh, verse number 10 next time. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer tonight. We'll we'll be dismissed. Thank, thank y'all so much for being here. And uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for... Your many blessings. Thank you for allowing us to be gathered here as we are. Lord, uh, we ask that you bless this church, these that come out in and out the doors, those that, uh, Lord, as we go our separate ways, we usually, during the week, we might, we're in a lot of different places. Help us to be the shining light that we need to be where you've placed us. Have your way in our lives, Lord. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.